Hey, what's happening? You're listening to the Change Truth Podcast, where I speak to people about drugs, addiction, and mental health. This time, I'm talking to Joanne Hutzel. Joanne is a registered psychologist with a PhD in clinical psychology. She is registered number 1033 with the College of Psychologists of British Columbia, and she's been providing therapy for people in the Yukon for 25 years now. So she has a ton of experience, and we talk mainly about what she's seen in that time as far as addiction goes. I really enjoyed talking to Joanne. She has some great insight as to why people get addicted and also how they can change. So check it out. This is me with Joanne Hutzel on the psychology of addiction. I am trained as a generalist, so I was born and raised here in the Yukon, and I knew there was a small population. I knew I wanted to do psychotherapy, and, and I knew I wanted to come back here and do it. Okay. So I deliberately decided not to become a specialist, and except for a bit of specializing in addictions, because I knew that addictions are uh, were quite a problem up here, still right. are probably, in my view. Um, the people who come to see me, um, I tend to do longer-term work, and I have in the past at least had quite a long wait list so who eventually gets through the door tends to be people with kind of ingrained not ingrained issues but um chronic I mean, or longer term chronic's a loaded word yeah yeah with deeper issues and um in okay. all kinds of varieties of areas usually some addictive areas and in my opinion addictions can be to substances or to many other things, like to psychoactive yeah. substances, or to uh, food, or to work, or to the internet, uh, yeah. gambling, porn, you name it. I mm -hmm. mean, we th we think of addictions, most often people think of addictions in a way too narrow of a way, mm -hmm. I think, so. Yeah, I would agree, totally. Yeah. So who comes to see me? Uh, People who are looking for in-depth work with a generalist psychotherapist. Right, I see. So you take on sort of all sorts of different things. It's hard to narrow down exactly because you're you're generalist, so you're yeah. you're seeing people with all sorts of mental health issues, from minor to, but mostly pretty severe. Or I don't know if severe is the right word. Actually, well, I would say more kind of moderate. Um, I think people with more severe mental health issues mm -hmm. who maybe have acute flare-ups need a... A specialist? Well, not only a specialist, but an agency where staff are available and oh, there's yeah. reception and they, there's crisis parts right, of the right. team. Whereas, you know, I don't have a receptionist. you got to make an appointment. <laughs> right, gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So, so you do deal with the people who come in with addictions, and you mentioned before that it's not it's not like just alcohol, but it's also like cocaine, and obviously you just mentioned you've dealt with you've obviously seen people with addictions to other things like gambling, or the internet, or, or things yeah. like that. So I guess what I would like to ask you is when someone comes in and say I come in and I'm completely addicted to alcohol, and I've been drinking alcohol daily for years, where would you start in helping that person? What what's the sort of procedure? that you would go through? The first step usually is, does the person see it as a problem? So uh, someone they recognize it. Yeah, someone can come in and have been drinking daily for years and truly not believe that they have a problem. <laughs> and they're coming in because... Something else. Yeah. Oh, okay. So sometimes they're not actually coming to you and saying, oh, I have an addiction. They're like coming to you with something else and then you find out that through a course of dialogue that, oh, they're drinking every day too, like on top of whatever else they think exactly. is the issue. Exactly. I don't know for sure, but I would suspect that people who have got to the point where they're really accurately seeing, I have an addiction problem, may be more likely to go to alcohol and drug services or may be right. more likely to go to their doctor and get a referral to a treatment center. If right. they're First Nations people, they might be more likely to um, go to their um, NADAP counselor in their in their First Nation government and ask right. for getting sent out to a treatment center. Or right. even now there's a local uh, land-based treatment at Jackson Lake. So, yeah, probably people 
people don't come with me with addiction at the top of their list. Right. That makes sense. Addiction is just kind of one of the things that comes up maybe sometimes. That's funny then. So if you saw someone with addiction and they weren't recognizing it as part of the problem, would you say then like addiction is maybe seen as more of a symptom of a greater issue then? And would you try to get to a different issue with them? Like, Yeah, that would be, uh, that's a, a decent way of putting it. Um, I, I like to think often of addictions as defense mechanisms. They're ways of avoiding mm. pain yeah. and often costly and actually create their own pain. Right. Right. They they help you avoid pain in the short run. Oh, uh, yeah. And they add to your pain in the longer run. And so the underlying issues are there. And can I, I we can't work on them that well until we chip away at the defenses. Okay. Such as addictive behaviors or patterns or tendencies. And often we need to work on the defenses such as addictions to get more stability to safely work at, at the underlying issues. Uh especially if they're past trauma right or deeply ingrained feelings of shame or right and do you deep think anxiety do you, for example do you see a lot of that people coming in who maybe who do have addictive tendencies to also have a past major trauma or something that they haven't dealt with in the right way or past pain that's that maybe is manifesting in addictions and things yeah it can really vary um so some people with addictions have had very clearly, overtly traumatic histories where terrible things have happened over and over again or different things sequentially. Right. Other people with addictions, the difficulties in their past have been more subtle, be it neglect, be it emotional abuse, be it... Uh, wounded parents who've imposed their own needs and not really given the person a chance to become themselves. So it can really range. Right. And there's something about addictions where if you take a sensitive temperament and enough stress, the addictive behavior, the short-term relief becomes more valuable to an individual. Hmm. Uh, And the addiction develops its own momentum. Right. So it's like it, a spiral, yeah, snowball effect kind yeah. of thing. Yeah, it creates, gives you short-term relief, adds to your trouble in the longer run. You're sensitive, so you're even in more need of the short-term <laughs> relief, and then there's more trouble. So yeah, right. Sometimes the stressful or traumatic beginnings are almost become not as important as how hooked into the feedback right. loop the person gets. Right. And usually the the traumatic beginnings, I don't want to sound like I would ever minimize those. Mm-hmm. I think people tend to overemphasize those and then don't do enough work on getting out of that cycle sure. in the so here and the, now. Just the habitual routines of, of dealing with stress you kind of build over time. You just... It's very reinforcing if you're in short-term mode. Right. So what would you do when you help try to help someone with issues along these lines you do it through through dialogue mostly i'm I'm assuming you're talking to people and helping them talk through issues basically yes how does that kind of go in general like i'm just curious how it how you start off you obviously kind of have to build trust first right they have to trust you to talk to you openly yeah and then is it like are you trying to get at issues that they themselves don't even know are issues like you're trying to through dialogue have things just come out that they don't even know is there? That, again, would vary. Uh, Some people are very insightful, self-aware, and they have a lot of honesty. Like they look at themselves honestly and they can see and they know when they're still stuck and they want me to help them Mm. shift. Other people have blind spots and through dialogue and gradually building trust, they may feel safe enough to to sort of crack open and look at themselves. And and so it's not that I try and get them to see. (laughs) It's more um, probably in a number of ways, try and increase a sense of safety and reduce shame. Like this is non-judgmental, non-judgmental. And gradually the person is able to go, you know, the, you know, I was taking a look at it the other day and I think, I think I I need to be on the internet. 
for example, like, I, I don't think I can function without it. And it's like, I would never tell them that. Right. They have to no, come to I would it. Rarely tell them that. And it's way better if people can come to it. And I don't, you know, there's lots of different ways to help people get to the point where they can uh, be more honest with themselves. Right. One of the keys is non judgmentalness, uh, staying on the leading edge of where there's a little bit of an opening, kind of touching <laughs> on it a little bit. <laughs> right. Just as much as they can handle, sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. That's very interesting. So, you're, obviously, that would vary as far as procedure. With with each person you're you're dealing with, they're going to handle things differently. You have to approach different people in different ways. It seems like a very complicated process, but I assume it's a slow process as well. Usually, um, I I agree. I think it's very complicated. I think uh, the model I use primarily is like a a mixture in terms of treatment interventions, and and one of my main ways of understanding people is called the psychodynamic model, and that that is where we believe people have a lot of defenses and everybody's defense package <laughs> is different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, how I would help someone chip away at loosening some of their defenses so they can more honestly work on themselves totally depends on what's in their defense package and how tight it's. All right. So give me some examples of defenses. What kind of defenses do people have? Well, a big one that really goes with addiction is avoidance. So people will do whatever they can to avoid pain. Right. Um, denial of reality is a defense mechanism. Intellectualization okay, is yeah. a defense mechanism. Um, seeing what uh, is in me that's paining me and denying that it's there and putting it on you. That's called projection. Uh, yeah. That's another defense mechanism. Right. Um, all these ways of avoiding the truth of the situation, whatever it yeah. is, just trying to rationalize it or just put yes. it on someone else. Or Yes. That's very interesting. Yes. Rationalization, <laughs> which is slightly different than intellectualization, is another okay. defense mechanism. Oh, yeah. Justifying. Minimizing is okay. another one. So through the course of talking to someone, then you try to pick up on what maybe what you think some, some of their defense mechanisms are. And so then how, so say you, you were talking to me and it became clear that I was um, ra trying to rationalize er all of my behavior and I wasn't sort of taking responsibility for any of the negative consequences in my life. Or So how would you get me then to, to try to deal with it? And maybe I, you know, same addicted to cocaine, but I was like, it just works for me. It's on the weekend and it works and it just gets things done. And I, even if I do it, you know, six times a week, it just, it helps. It works for me. It's, this is how it does, you know. Gradually over time, things like nothing I could say to you in the moment alone would be enough. Mm. Things like, uh, it seems like you really need to have some reasons. Mm. Okay. You know, I, I hear a little bit of urgency when you're, when you're telling me these reasons, like you really want me to believe them. Uh, so just to try to make the person think about what they're doing. Right. Yeah. Just get that perspective on their own behavior. Exactly. Exactly. A little bit of a watcher, a little bit of a step back. Right. Do you hear how you usually give me a list of reasons? I would need to say it very non-judgmentally. I just, yeah. I'm curious, I'm interested. Can we just observe how you're functioning? Right. right. That's a big part of it is because if someone feels like you're just judging them, that's that's a big step backwards, I guess. They're not going to yep. then open up or... Fuels the defense. Right. Yeah. As it should. I wouldn't, I would get more defensive if I felt like someone had this underlying, yeah. you know, belief that I was bad or wrong. Or, yeah, right. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> or that what I was doing was bad or wrong. I, I always think there's a good reasons for the defensiveness mm. and that you need to respect the person's pacing at loosening them. Mm. And right. sometimes it's a good idea to leave them alone. Oh, yeah. So. Not press too hard for some, for some people. Yep. They might press back, I guess, or whatever. Or break down. Yeah. You know. Break down, yeah. Break down communication. Well, a breakdown mentally. If you push defenses too hard, if people are fairly wounded and they need their defensive uh, yeah. structure. Then they're left with without anything or without any. Possibly. You know, having a nervous breakdown, as they're called, or, right. you know, lo losing touch with reality or becoming extremely depressed or. Right. So if, if you 
had to sort of list the um, the people that you've seen over the years come in with addictions. What are the most common addictions that you've seen in the Yukon? Mm. Probably in this practice, which is not a very, it's not a good random sampling of Yukoners because because of the wait list and right. you, people have to pay me out of their own pocket and right mm, as a right. private practice psychologist. Um, alcohol, cigarettes, um, food, mm. work, <laughs> work, yeah, <laughs> work, and uh, it's a little bit debatable if this is a addiction, but I, I would say control. Oh yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and in the food, I would include bulimia, for example. Oh okay. Yeah, right. it's not just obesity, but also. Uh, binging and purging cycles. Right. right. And that's kind of an addictive behavior too, I suppose. It's yeah. It's those same lines. Although, you know, as I'm talking, it occurs to me that the biggest addiction, in my opinion, that I see in here is people being addicted to other people. Oh. Okay, so... Yeah, explain that a little bit. Well, the high that people get from being in love and you know, needing attachment and needing to be cared about and sacrificing and compromising, all, having all kinds of costs in the longer run because of the short-term need for to not be alone. Mm. Uh, so what are some of the sort of costs that that would bring about for a person? Well, people stay in unhealthy relationships. Okay. Some, you know, sometimes where there's... Right, stay through abuse or... Or being used or you know, emotional Just, or physical abuse, or it's it's feeding their inner neediness and that stops a person from growing. Mm, okay. There's right. a book called um, something like, How Do I Give Up My Relationship? To, How Do I Stop My Relationship When I'm Addicted to Somebody? It's a very questionable title. <laughs> <laughs> it's an excellent book and it talks about attachment hunger mm. and attachment when people haven't been loved well enough, how the need to have attachment can dominate all other needs. Right. Um, That's funny. That is like my take on it or my, what I believe a big part of addiction is, is this is the filling of, of a sort of void. And then if you're going to replace an addiction, you have to fill that void with another thing, like something positive or, you know, like someone like for me, I haven't been addicted to anything major, but I've, I've in the past of abused marijuana, I've been addicted to the, my habitual routine of smoking mar marijuana when I get bored all the time. So then when I had to replace that boredom with something else. So that I didn't just turn to marijuana when I got bored, I had to turn to something else. I had to figure out an, a hobby or go, you know, go, go start hanging out with more friends or start doing something so that I wasn't just getting bored and then abusing this drug. And I think it can be kind of similar in someone who's in a relationship like that. You'd have to fill that need in another way, right? You can't, it's not like if someone's in an abusive relationship and then they get out of it and they and they are someone who has this void this emptiness this need for for this connection they're going to have to still get that connection and maybe do it in a healthier way or what would you recommend people do to overcome that sort of need for for that connection to a romantic partner or something like that yeah i think you're you're absolutely right that there's this hole inside or this emptiness that uh is a very difficult thing for people to live with and many models of helping people with addictions uh, suggest healthier alternatives what are you going to do instead and that's very wise in my opinion that's a great thing for people to ask themselves is there i need to do something else instead what can i do the piece i would add to that is um part of what i think people need to do is to learn how to be with that emptiness so stop mm. running away from it Okay. okay yeah. So you learn to be with it, and you also need some ways of uh, soothing it and nurturing it to some degree, right? right? And the main model I go with is um, self-nurturing, because hmm. you'll always be with yourself. So can you take care of that inside yourself to some degree instead of always looking to alcohol or a cigarette or another okay. person or a chocolate cake or whatever, right? right? Because so. you don't want to just be constantly trying to fill it with other things either because any good thing can also become a bad thing if, if it's abused, I suppose. so. <laughs> I, I totally agree, yeah. 
Right. So it's a kind of a balancing act more than anything. You got to get the right balance of uh, filling the void, but also not um, turning to whatever solution you find every time. Or Well, partly my experience is, is that people learn to be with the discomfort. It becomes, it almost instantly becomes smaller and more manageable. Um, and if they nurture themselves, that tends to, to reduce the intensity on that neediness. And then you stop craving things. So you, mm. you don't have to have things. You may want things. You may enjoy things. Yeah, you right. may celebrate things. And you don't need them. Yeah. And if you still need them, even if you're gritting your teeth and trying to be moderate about it, to me, it's still addiction. Right. Not that any of us can ever totally get rid of that. Yeah. Right? I think we're all addicted to something probably to some yeah. degree. Right? So, yeah. That's what I always say is it's it's kind of levels, right? You can be sort of addicted to a coffee in the morning or you could be addicted to cocaine at night. And it's just different levels of what works for whatever person. And Yeah, I agree. How bad they're trying to <laughs> fill something up. But before we started, we started talking about um, your own personal use because you said you don't really use drugs, but you, you drink alcohol. Yeah. And so the difference between you drinking, I don't know how much you drink, but maybe you, whatever you can tell me you drink on the weekend or something. What's the difference between the way you drink and the way an alcoholic would drink? What kind of emotional or void sort of thing is going on there? Well, yeah, that inner hole or neediness can be the base of an addiction the avoidance of shame can also be a, the base of an addiction. If you ask me, if a person feels like they're a bad person, it, can they do something that helps them uh, not feel like a bad person? So if I have a drink, first of all, I would rarely have more than two. And would I say 99% of the time, I don't need the drink. I might want it. I right. might enjoy it. And I could easily say, no, I won't have it. So right. I think a person with alcoholism uh, doesn't feel near as much choice about having the drink or not, Right. usually, and also needs more and more because whether it's filling a hole or blocking out shame, it's never enough with alcohol or whatever, never actually They're fills never, that yeah. hole right. or never completely blocks out the shame where you, when you wake up the next day, it's there. Then there's the whole issue of tolerance, right? There's lots of people Yeah. Right. after two drinks, I will be tipsy. Yeah. <laughs> and there's lots of people who can have eight drinks and you wouldn't know that they drank if it didn't yeah. have an aroma. It's right? kind of a funny thing about addiction. It's almost like a natural sort of nature's way of telling you, you shouldn't do this all the time. Because when you start doing it all the time, you build up such a tolerance to pretty much anything. It doesn't matter what you're doing. You do it all the time. You don't get that same feeling from it. So you have to do more and more and more until it becomes like a ridiculous amount. One thing that uh, Patricia mentioned to me um, when I I spoke with her uh, on my last podcast, she said that statistically, the people who overdose the most, when we're talking about things like uh, heroin use, okay. these the people who overdose most often are people who get out of prison because before they went to prison, they had this tolerance buildup. They're yeah. using the drug every day and then they get out of prison after like five months and then they go back to using what they were using before, but it's way too much at this point because they've lost that tolerance and then they overdose and they yeah. die or... Yeah. yeah. Even some, yeah, I don't know for sure the scientifically, but I bet even if they cut their regular dose in half or a quarter, mm -hmm. it still might be It's way amazing too much. how the body can adapt yeah. to having stuff. And alcohol is kind of scary that way because alcohol um, is one of the most difficult to stop using when you're a chronic user because your body becomes so physically dependent on having it in the system that when you just remove it cold turkey, you can die. People can um, become very sick and uh, can actually die and which is not the case for a lot of drugs a lot of drugs don't have that same real physical danger um, with withdrawal anyway uh, as alcohol does well yeah i'm i don't know for sure the all the facts on that i i know that the sedatives and an anxiolytics the anti-anxiety drugs which mm. you know prescription drugs that people may be addicted to um are very dangerous if you stop suddenly 
So right. it's not just alcohol and, you know. Yeah, no, there are, I mean, yeah. obviously, when you talk about, like, opiate addiction, that's obviously very dangerous as well with people. Well, yeah, yeah, you can feel pretty terrible the, the amount of, I, my understanding is the amount of inner physical craving and the, the general malaise is pretty terrible. And with things like Xanax or um, right. uh, Ativan. Do you prescribe? No. Prescribe? No, you no. don't. Okay. Psychologists are not medical Right. trained where uh, although there's some movements afoot in the states and a little bit in Canada to if you take a bunch of extra training you could do some limited prescribing like of oh, antidepressants okay. but it's pretty small so that's not something you're working with then is you're not pr prescribing do you recommend that people look into any anti-anxiety or antidepressant medication I help people try and think through the pros and cons it's rarely well only I, only very thoughtfully. There's a, usually always pros and cons. Yeah. What's so. your opinion? I mean, you have a sort of, some for some people they work and for some people they don't work. Or what's your opinion on, on a lot of those kind of like SSRI type medication? I, I am not up on all. I know there's a lot of controversy out there about them. And I am not fully up to date on all the current research. Um, I think... That in situations, if people are, if they've tried very hard, tons of different ways to try and get some relief from a severe depression, and they're fully informed of the possible risks of uh, using antidepressant medication, and they feel like they want to give it a shot in case it helps rebalance that part of their brain where the serotonin is, that I would respect that decision. Like, I, I would think that's a reasonable decision. I think if someone is mildly depressed and hasn't done hardly any uh, grunt work to try and change some things that might right. help their mood and lift, I get a little concerned how quickly and easily people will move towards this This pill might make me feel better. Right. So, yeah, you don't want to promote it as some miracle cure that's just gonna you take the pill and then your problems go away it's kind of like you want to promote the idea of people working at the issues and then maybe using some of the medication as a sort of supplement to that work they're doing to help them balance or that that kind of teamwork that's kind of how my understanding of the medical model is uh try the lifestyle changes, the talk therapy, da 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 da. If that doesn't work, um, then maybe try and see if there can be teamwork between medicine right. and and the talk therapy. And then, you know, if things are really severe and really intractable, then they'll get more serious about more medicine and Right. Yeah, that's kind of my understanding too. Like I don't I'm it's definitely not my field of expertise at all is the sort of the antidepressant, anti-anxiety drugs. I've I've never used them myself, but I, I have heard from certain people that they do help. Some people yep. say they really help them get their life back on track. And and I'm I've always been kind of someone who leans against the uh idea of using the sort of pharmaceutical anti-anxiety kind of stuff. I, I've always been very cautious and hesitant about that stuff. But I've heard people really say that, swear by them, say like it really helped them just move through a certain situation in their life or move through a certain issue that they were having and, and balance their sort of, and so they wouldn't have as, as um, they wouldn't go into as deep of a depression. Right. It would kind of balance their, keep them more level, like in a balanced uh, state of mind more, more frequently instead of having these ups and downs all the time, which yeah. makes sense. I mean, it makes sense that it can help, but I do, I do definitely think that if people are, I mean, my personal opinion is that if people are having bad issues with depression or anxiety, it, it is about talking it out and, and really real, making a realization about why the, what the root cause of these things are. And I, 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 I like to think that it's, it's not just like a sort of imbalance of serotonin and chemicals in the brain. I, I feel like it's more to do with environment and how traumas and pain and things that people have experienced but that's just my opinion i don't really maybe i mean i'm sure there probably are people who have real imbalances going on i mean i don't know who knows <laughs> yeah i think uh i think it's a very young science this whole thing of uh 
psychology uh, or psychiatry or understanding mental illness. And I think the more we say we don't really know for sure that that's probably accurate, odds are uh, diversity is the answer, that there are people that it's mostly environmental, and then there are people where there's huge biological com components, and then there's a whole bunch of people <laughs> where it's a interaction between the right. two. Um, and I think we need to be humble that we don't know for sure. Right. It's To me, it's amazing what people will discover that we never thought of. <laughs> it never occurred to us that. Right. So, yeah, I think I agree. Just be hesitant on saying anything is the be all, end all, or is the cure, the answer, or the truth. Yeah. You yeah. got to kind of keep a balanced approach. Well, and the whole, you know, psychology is supposedly our, one of our big strengths is critical thinking. So, what is the research, relevant research, quality research to date, and what does it suggest, and it, how conclusive <laughs> is it? So right. if we always kept that in mind, we'd most of the time be going, well, we don't really know for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, There's right. some research that suggests this, and yeah. we don't know for sure. Yeah, and that's, I think that's hard for people to uh, to take that approach. People want to be right, or just they want to have the answer now. And yes. So it can yes. Become... And that <laughs> so. kind of dichotomous black and white thinking is a defense mechanism <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> to avoid the discomfort of ambiguity. Oh, uh, yeah, that makes okay. sense. You don't want to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which North America is really good at. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Right on. Well, uh, I think we got a lot of great information out there. Thanks so much for talking to me. That You're was, very welcome. I, I think I learned quite a bit in that discussion about just the psychology of addiction and, and whatnot. Well, I enjoyed your questions and your comments as well. All right, that's it. That's the podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. If you'd like to find out more about the work that I'm doing and the people I'm interviewing, check out changetruth.com.